so to get started, you need to install it. Um, unfortunately, it's one of these things where it's different for every platform out there. So I can't go through all the platforms because we're here all day. Um, and I hate to just to say, go to the website and click on platform of choice, but that's, that's really it. The, the, the instructions on the actual website are actually quite good, so you'll probably get up and running. But once you do that, you should be seeing this. So if you go to localhost and port 8080, you'll see a Jenkins build uh, with not much in it. Uh, so the starters, um, authentication. It doesn't come with authentication. So uh, if you're, uh, you know, if, if, if it's uh, available to the outside world, um, anyone can do anything with it. So it's probably a good idea to secure it in some way. Um, and there's all sorts of different ways of, of doing that. Uh, I mean, even from local user groups to, you know, domain authentication if you've, if you've got that running in your business. Um, but the simplest way to do it is to uh, go into uh, the configuration settings and enable security, uh, and that will give you the option to then start creating users. Um, however, one, one pitfall is it's quite easy to lock yourself out here, uh, but it is <laughs> fairly easy to get back in. Uh, just go to this config.xml file uh, and remove the uh, use security thing, and that will take away the security from the system. Uh, it's probably a good point to, to check out uh, the anatomy of Jenkins then. So on a Linux box, it'll be under var.lib uh, slash lib slash Jenkins. Uh, and it may contain uh, one or more of the following folders and files. Um, if you install plugins and things, you tend to see more things added to this list. Uh, but you can see the config.xml file there. Uh, that stores the configuration for Jenkins as a whole. So uh, anything that you, you configure in terms of security and and domain authentication goes in there. Um, so when you when you set up jobs, uh, all the configuration for the jobs will be stored in jobs, uh, and workspace will be used for storing any code that's stored uh, that's generated through the, throughout the process of your builds. Um, so jobs stores the configuration, whereas workspace stores the code. Uh, SSH is also important if you're doing uh, Git um, or source control. Uh, because you'll need to set up your SSH keys within this folder rather than your, uh, your main SSH folder. Uh, so where do we get started in Jenkins? <coughs> you okay, Nick? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, so the first thing to sort of try out Jenkins and see if you, uh, you know, get more familiar with it um, is actually to run a Drupal cotton. Uh, this is fairly easy to do. Um, and just involves you know, simple setups and simple processes. So uh, on the main screen of the Jenkins build, you'll see this uh, create new build or create new job. Uh, and your get screen looks like this. Um, ignore, you can pretty much ignore everything on this. Uh, what you want to do is build a freestyle software project 98% uh, of the time. Um, uh, as I said, it's a Java tool built for Java developers. So they got reference system Maven and things, which is in a, you know, big in the Java world, but probably not important for you in a, as a Drupal dev. Uh, so when you click OK on that, you'll get this screen. Um, this is the, the main uh, Jenkins configura configuration screen. So each of these sections deals with different things about, about your build and what's going on with it. Uh, but for a Drupal cron, we'll look at build triggers and uh, the build, uh, build actions. <coughs> So, yeah, when you set up a, uh, a build trigger, what you can do is set up a cron, uh, a build periodically, basically. Uh, and the, uh, everyone know what cron tab is? Sort of the five stars in a row, yeah? You can use the same syntax there, so you can, you can type in your, your one and four, four stars will give you every hourly. Uh, or you can use these keywords like hourly, which will build it hourly. There's also weekly and monthly and yearly if you need. Uh, that's, that's fairly straightforward. Uh, and then what you need to do is set up a execution task. Uh, and this is basically code pulled from the uh, Drupal.org docs. Um, what we're doing here is running a wget on an external address. Uh, and the uh, what you need to do is pick up the cron uh, URL from your uh, reporting dashboard within Drupal and just pop it in here. Um, and that's pretty much it. 
So once you save this, you'll, you'll have started running cron uh, remotely every hour. Um, it's also a good idea to know if it fails at any point. So you can set up what's called a post-build action, uh, which will let you know if it fails at, at some point. So um, you can uh, add in e email notifications, uh, and there's all sorts of <coughs> different ways of notifying you there. The uh, send separate emails to individuals who broke the build is about source control. So if you've got source control integration, it'll email the person that's responsible for breaking things, which can be handy. Uh, so once you save that, you'll get this. Uh, and this is, this is on the main Jenkins screen. Um, so just go through all these points. The blue dot on the end is the current status of the build. Uh, so it, it says blue, which is nice and, nice and happy. If it's red, that means it's failed for some reason uh, and it's not, not been too good. The W is weather, so it looks over the past five or six um, recent builds and tries to give you a gauge about how healthy the project is. Um, so the weather gets progressively worse the more that the build fails. Uh, and then if you want to run the, the build uh, manually, there's this button on the end. If you just press it, that'll, that'll trigger a build straight away. Okay, so uh, before we get into the next step, there's uh, Jenkins plugins. So to do anything outside of this point, you'll probably need a plugin of some sort. Uh, and there's a nice plugin manager there. So if you're going to manage Jenkins and manage plugins, um, there's a huge list of plugins available. Uh, so have, have a look through, basically. Uh, I'll be mentioning one or two uh, later on in the talk. So. so the next step then is probably code analysis. Now this is probably, you know, it's quite a useful step to do, um, you know, keeping an eye on what you're doing. Um, but what do I mean by code analysis? So it could be something as simple as syntax checking. So just literally running a lint across your project to make sure that there's no syntax errors there. Um, you can check for coding standards violations um, or analyze for duplication of code, um, which can be useful you know, if, you, if you're copying blocks of code around. Uh, if you want to put those into a single place, then it'll, it'll give you a warning there. Um, but essentially what you're trying to do is check for potential problems in the source code. Uh, however, before you do that, um, you're going to get into a mess, um, and I, I learned this quite early on in, in Jenkins. You have to follow some rules in order to get, get sort of the best, the best approach out of Jenkins. So obviously the source control. Getting your code into Jenkins is easiest if you use uh, any source control system. Uh, we use Git at Access, but uh, I mean, due to poison really. <coughs> Uh, but the whole system is set up around a source control system. So if you, you know, if you, you probably can get it in the, in other ways, but it's it's going to make your life difficult. Um, analyze your own code. This is kind of kind of useful if you're doing a, a coding analysis, a coding standards analysis on a Drupal project. You don't want to inspect every file, uh, even the ones you don't you're not really responsible for, like views and C tools and things because you're going to get a lot of errors. Um, so it's going to, you know, you'll get, uh, it'll be more difficult to spot the things that are wrong with your code. It's also kind of important to know what you're analyzing. Um, so you, you, know, you can analyze your own code, but make sure you know what it is you're trying to analyze for. And then understand the output of these things. Um, I'll, I'll come into the output later on, but uh, you need to sort of take them with a pinch of salt, really. Um, but standardization uh, will, will save you a lot of time as well. But what do I mean by standardizing in this point? So it's things like making sure you have a uh, the same repo structure. So every time you set up a, a, a repo for a Drupal site, put it in a Docker root or a public HTML folder. It keeps it outside of the, you know, the root of the uh, source code uh, and helps you do things. So if you want to add scripts to it, you don't you know, embed them into the Drupal source code, you, know. you can put them outside of that. Any make files you have can go into a, a separate, uh, separate folder. Um, having a, a simple thing like this, uh, the modules directory, if you have any co contrib modules like views, put them in a contrib folder that keeps them separate from your own code base and makes it a lot easier to, to scan your code base and make sure that you're 
um, you, you know what you're doing, really. Um, if you're th using things like Amiga, the theme templates will be set up in a certain way, but um, if you're not and you're doing it customly, uh, then you know, put all your JavaScript files in a JavaScript folder. It just it makes sense in the long run. Um, so to you to put to pull your source code into Jenkins, you need the Jenkins Git plugin. Uh, this is perhaps the most complicated part of your process, uh, mainly because you need to the best results are using SSH keys. Uh, <coughs> but the chances are that you'll probably get a bit, a bit mixed up using them. It took me a few attempts to get them, get them quite right. Uh, but the idea is that if you can, if you do, if you can, if you can do a git clone locally, uh, then you can move those git keys into your SSH folder within the Jenkins directory, and then make sure that Jenkins picks those keys up when it, when it does things. Um, but when you, uh, with the git plugin, you'll get this git option uh, and you can add in your repository URL into there. Uh, if there's anything that, if Jenkins can't actually get hold of that for any reason, it'll let you know. So it's a good test to see before you start breaking builds um, what's going on. The uh, question marks in the blue boxes are quite useful. Um, if you click on those, it'll drop down a little uh, help menu, uh, help system, and tell you what, what sort of things each checkbox is for. Uh, So onto syntax checking. Um, so PHP lint is actually built into PHP. So if you're in PHP minus L on a file, you'll get, you know, it'll tell you what's going on with the file. Um, however, you can only do one file at a time. So checking an entire project is kind of a bit difficult unless you create lots of scripts and pull things together. Um, but there's a tool called Fing, which is a, a different build tool but this is a, a PHP build tool um, written in PHP that's controlled through XML files uh, and integrates quite nicely with Jenkins itself. Um, but I know what you're thinking, there's that word again, build. Uh, don't worry too much about it. It's basically an automation tool that helps you, in, in the same way that Jenkins is an automation tool, you know, it'll copy files and it'll uh, do all sorts of things. So we, we use Fing and PHP Lint together so you need to add the thing build file to your source code, which goes back to the standardization. If you have a, a scripts folder, pop in your, your, bin, your thing files into the scripts folder, and you keep a record of what's going on. But what we need to do, basically, is tell thing what files we want to scan. Uh, use the PHP, thing, uh, PHP lint fin task to scan the files, and then fail if any errors are found. Fairly simple. Uh, and we produce a file that looks like this. Can you read that at the back? Should have put that in bold, really. <laughs> um, but every every thing file uh, is basically XML, uh, and you have a uh, a project which holds everything inside it. And then inside that, you have targets. Um, so in this case, I've got a, a syntax check underscore PHP, uh, and inside that. I use file set, so the file set uh, is used to sort of tell thing what files you want to include, and then I pass that into the PHP lint task uh, and tell it to halt when there's a, a failure. Now this communicates with Jenkins and will, you know, it will uh, cause Jenkins to, to fail a build if your if your thing task fails. Uh, you can actually run this locally um, with thing minus f and the build file uh, and then the target within the build file. So we then need to add the finger plugin into Jenkins. Uh, so you need to create a build action uh, and invoke a thing target. And what we're doing here is invoking the syntax check PHP target. Uh, the build file is the same build file before, but we've got this dollar workspace. Remember the workspace directory um, in the Jenkins directory? Uh, dollar workspace points at that. So it's actually a, a Jenkins um, plugin, a uh, Jenkins parameter that helps us sort of reference um, local files. Um, so that's pretty much it. So 
in the same way as before, we now have syntax checking on, on our entire project, which is good. Um, so what next? Well, coding standards, obviously. So <coughs> this starts off with the check style plugin, which is a, uh, a Jenkins plugin. So what we need to do is feed a check style.xml file into this. Um, obviously, we don't write this ourselves. So what we do is we get a tool called PHP Code Sniffer. This is a, a, pair, a pair package um, that analyzes for coding standards and produces our, our um, check style XML. So to install it, um, obviously pair install PHP Code Sniffer. And then we need to uh, define the Drupal coding standards. And these are kept in the coder module. So what we do is download the coder module and then link it into uh, PHP Code Sniffer. So we can run PHP Code Sniffer using this. So PHP CS, and then this is a, a directory that we keep uh, a custom, <coughs> custom module in. Only we're not actually using the Drupal coding standard yet, so we need to add in the standard to say Drupal. Uh, but by default, PHP Code Sniffer only looks at PHP files. So we need to tell it to look at extensions like module and ink and install and things where all the PHP code is. Um, and then we need to tell PHP Code Sniffer to use the check style output. So we'd say report in the style of check style. Um, we're still not done yet. We need to then uh, tell it what <coughs> file to produce. So within, so report file equals check style XML. Now I don't know about you, but I love writing this every time I want to check the syntax on a project. Um, so there's something missing here. Git stores the code, obviously. Uh, PHP code sniffer produces the reports, and Jenkins processes the reports. Um, but what fits all these things together? Thing again. Uh, we'll basically, <coughs> Thing is uh, one of these tools that fits in with everything. So we use the PHP code sniffer <coughs> Thing module in the same way that we use uh, the lint checker. And we scan, the, uh, we scan our project. So we produce a file that looks like this. And in this case, the file set contains um, references to a custom module we've created and a custom theme. Uh, and then what we do is we pass that into a PHP code sniffer using the Drupal standard. And then uh, the formatter outputs that as a textile.xml file. That's fine. And the same thing again to add that into uh, Jenkins um, in the, exactly the same way as the, the syntax checker. Uh, and then all you need to do then is put a, a post um, build, build step in the same way that you would do a notifications. Um, and we tell Jenkins to pick up the check style report and produce a graph with it. And then we get something that looks like this. This is actually a, <coughs> from my own website. It looks like a lot of errors, doesn't it? Um, as I said before, you can scan these things and understand the output, but take what they say with a pinch of salt. So we can click on any part of this and look at the at a real sort of detailed analysis of what's going on. Um, so for example, the, uh, I'm going to look at the, the password uh, file in this. And it says it has 354 errors. But they mostly consist of things like this. Um, so this is two errors on this line because I've missed a space out of the semicolon. So it should be semi a semicolon space which is part of the standard. Um, so although coding standards are great, and you, know, you sure will be following them, uh, the, the output can be a little bit scary at, at first, because you'll, you'll obviously have a lot of errors in there. Um, so what next? Uh, try it for yourself. So um, <coughs> there's mess detection, which looks at co uh, duplication of code and potential errors and things. And that can be analyzed by the, um, uh, the PMD analysis results graphs. <coughs> There's also things like copy and paste detect, um, which can be looked at duplicate code analysis results within Jenkins. Uh, but essentially, that's, that's pretty much the recipe. So you create your, your thing task to run the action, and you get Jenkins to automate it. Or you can get Fing to generate a report, and then get Jenkins to pick up that report. 
Uh, yeah, so if you want to, I'm pretty much finished. <laughs> Am I early? It's fine, it's good. Yeah. Um, Can we go back about eight slides, the one that has like the list of how it operates together? That so one? That one? Yeah. All right. I'll put these slides online later with a, a couple more. Um, I have taken the one out to do with um, adding uh, Git keys. I thought that might be a bit boring, but <laughs> um, this, this is one of these tools that you, it's difficult to kind of get started, but um, once you've got the basic recipes, and I've, I think I've described those here, um, it, it's actually quite easy to set up more rules and, and look at different things and get other things going. How long Any does questions? it take when you, add, when you add the code sniffer analysis in? How much longer does it take? Um, I did do a, a full analysis of an entire Drupal project once, uh, which was on for three hours. Okay. <laughs> um, but we only have a, we got a little box in the side of the room. You know, you can run Jenkins on a network perfectly well. Uh, but what, what I thought then is, is there any point in running a code, you know, coding stiffer on an entire Drupal build? So I run it on just the code that we produced during the project, and it takes about five minutes. Is there an option so to run it just on the change files, or is that a bit more complicated? That would be more complicated. Yeah. Yeah, so you'd have to copy the change files to separate directory. One thing to ask on. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 When you run it on core, did it fan much? On core? Yeah. It found low. <laughs> yeah. I mean, uh, yeah, when we, Drupal tries to be uh, you know, as clean as possible. Um, but there are, I mean, some of the contrib modules will introduce things that um, break, break the coding standards. But it's simple things like li missing out spaces behind characters and things, or adding characters to spaces. And, um, so the vast majority will be simple formatting, rather than you know put in the, putting er er any errors in the code. Drupal have got that implemented on uh, contract modules, so then they can reject them quicker. Yeah. Funnily enough, if you start off the uh, the process of trying to get Git access to Drupal.org. Um, most of the time you'll spend is getting your, your code formatted in Drupal coding standards. Right. However, once you've got the, the Git access, no one really cares. <laughs> um, so I think, yeah, I think an automated test of some sort might be, might be useful in that case. Any other? Uh, where am I here? So the, the oh, options and properties in here, yeah. in the part of the thing plugin, you can do this. It's got like a little drop down box, does it, does it detect what properties you can it uh, I don't think so. <laughs> uh, you can also uh, run it through command line, um, if you don't want to run it through thing, the thing plugin itself, uh, and just use the, the minus D, I think, option to, to pass in parameters on the fly. It took me a few weeks to figure out all the different bits and pieces, not you know, every, every day, but coming back to it. Um, but I can, I can set up a workspace on Jenkins in about an hour now, so, yeah. Um, once, you've, once you've got your thing files in place, uh, what I've done now is, is copy them from project to project. So I've now got this thing recipe book that I, I sort of bring with me on new projects. Um, so all I need to do then is just make a copy of a previous project I've got and away I go. Is there like a, a good sort of crib sheet how to set like a, a Drupal set? Because it's so configurable Jenkins, you know, when you get into it, you know, it's not just for Drupal and stuff. Mm. Is there like a resource or a site anywhere that's got like 
an, an idiot's guide to setting up. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Like, you don't know how to write it. Or yeah. Or something. I'll be writing this up as a blog post. Yeah. Um, late, later on, um, yeah. probably going into way more detail than is needed. So, because that's what I do. <laughs> um, but yeah, the, there are a few. If you look around for like Drupal and Thing um, plugins, you'll find one that's uh, it's pretty complicated, really, and pretty messy. Um, but will get you. Uh, it produces all the reports that you can think of. Uh, but you can also import. Uh, people can export their Jenkins configurations, and you can import them into a Jenkins build, and sort of start off with a with a job. Um, but even then, you need to. You need to have the thing code, the thing uh, tasks within your project uh, source code um, for that to work. So, um, yeah. Do you trigger um, a build every time you commit um, your GitHub thing, or do you set it to run on a uh, If I go back a few slides. Uh, it's not on that page. <laughs> So here, um, when the build triggers, the build periodically, you can get it to run every hour. But the poll SCM will check your source code to see if there's any updates. Um, and will only run a build if there's been a commit and it's been pushed into the source code. Which is quite handy, because you don't want to reanalyze everything again, just be, you know, even if it's the same. Um, so you use the poll SCM um, option to sort of uh, only check if there's any been, a, been any changes to the source code. Uh, you can do the same thing. So you can do it uh, hourly, if you like, or weekly. It depends on how fast your project uh, updates, really. But it'll only, it'll only pull the source code um, for changes and then run if there's been any changes, rather than run it anyway. You know. Uh, source code management, that's where you, you plug in your various different source code. So I've got there's, there's Git there. Right. So when I was talking about Git later on, if you click the, the Git bit, it'll drop down a list of Git options and you can. So is that the actual um, like trigger code and stuff for Jenkins, or is that, it's not your development code Git bit, is it? <laughs> that makes sense? Yeah, so that's, that's, your, that's your code base. Right. Yeah. OK. Um, How do you track changes to your free config? Uh, in the same way that you would normally, in that it's part of your source code. And it just lives as part of that project. Yeah. I mean, my, my thing scripts are sort of evolving over time, and I'm, I'm moving things in and out of them. But uh, uh, yeah, once, a, <coughs> once you get settled down to a, a particular file set of thing targets, it tends to say the same then, so, yeah. Okay. <laughs>